Cool. Hey friends, how are you doing? Welcome Hello. this evening. Thank I you. have Stephen Graybill with me and I'm really excited. He is one of the narrators for the Slow March of Light. If you have listened to the book yet, he narrates Bob Inama's point of view. Um, so Stephen, why don't you go ahead and just give your give us an introduction. Oh, okay. Um, I'm an audiobook narrator and an actor. Um, I've been narrating for I don't know, seven years or eight years or something like that. Um, mostly do a lot of nonfiction and a lot of fiction or a few fiction novels. Um, I don't know. I mean, what, what do you want to know? Like how I got into voice acting, I guess. Yeah, that, so um, I, I'd love to hear how you got started. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, I mean, I've, I've been training as an actor, uh, went to school for acting, and then I did Shakespeare in DC for a year or so or something like that. Did a bunch of Shakespeare in New York and trained a lot as an actor and um, always wanted to do voiceovers. And I remember when I was younger, I like did a lot of the legwork to before cameras and iPhones and whatnot, did a lot, a lot of the legwork to uh, make a, a reel for myself. Basically, you know, found a casting director and she gave me copy and then I found an engineer and then, you know, we put together a reel and I gave that to my agents and that sat on their desk for three years and nothing happened and I was just going about, you know, I don't know, bartending and doing whatever you do in your late 20s in New York. Um, so then from there, I, I finally, she put me on an audition. I did the audition and that turned into three commercials, which was very, very fortunate and very lucky out of the draw. But I always wanted to be a voiceover actor, I always wanted to do characters and fun accents and all the different kinds of things. And then I finally moved out to LA about eight or eight years ago now. Mm -hmm. And when I got out to LA, I needed to find something else other than bartending because I just didn't want to do that anymore. So a couple friends of mine did audiobooks and uh, they, I just started looking on, I remember I came across my friend Piper Goodeve on her website had something about ACX and I was like, oh, what's that? And so I looked into that and then I had a, horrible UCB USB mic and a computer and was like, cool, I'll just do this in a closet. So I just sent out some auditions to ACX and got some books off of that. And then just kept doing that. My friends helped me record my first couple books. And then from there, I just kept recording because I didn't know anything else about the industry. I just knew about reading stories and then figuring out how to do that and what it like all of the did like the technical information about that. And uh, they taught me a lot about it, about sound recording and mic placement and all this other stuff. Um, they helped me record my first book. And then I just kept doing that maybe for like two or three years. And then I finally realized I just wanted to lean into it because it was going quite well and started building relationships with publishers and producers at publishing houses. Um, and then from there, that just sort of kicked me into a different gear and then I built a voiceover booth that I'm sitting in now and uh, worked every day and just, I, I don't stop reading books. I just read books all day. Well, it's, well, from the author's point of view, um, when we get a book and when a book is narrated and we start listening to it, like the first thing I do is I start to cringe. And this isn't, this isn't a book you did. So this <laughs> is like my early books because I'm like, oh, Fair. I, you know, because, because you hear like the repetitive words I didn't take out, like I said, perhaps like oh, yeah. not on purpose, like three times in the same paragraph. And so I, so I'm listening yeah. and then I have to say, okay, I got to block that out. Um, but what I love about a book being narrated is I feel like I'm almost, it's, it's hard to like stand apart from your story as a writer. So when someone mm -hmm. else is narrating it, you feel like you can then enjoy and immerse yourself into the story and characters without having your writer editing hat on. Um, but it really, I really yeah. love how you brought uh, the character of Bob Inama to life. Um, oh, thank you. Because um, he, what, he was just a very, um, just kind of a quiet person throughout his life. And he just had a really mm. deep spiritual foundation and he, he did, wasn't grandiose. And you just brought that personality to his character, I thought. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. I will say that I think that I basically just revealed what you had already written on the page. Because well, I think I, that's basically all we do as actors is right. just 
if the writing is bad, the book is going to be bad no matter what. There's some things I can do as an audiobook narrator, but not a lot. But if the writing is good and, and your book was very good, you can feel that in the writing. And I mean, there's times as an audiobook narrator that I can completely relate. It's interesting to hear you talk about it because on my end, I don't talk to the author. Yeah. So I'm like, I mean, perhaps three times in a paragraph. I don't get worked <laughs> up about that stuff. But like, you can hear and feel like the rhythm of a book. It's very interesting. But I think we're well, just I, revealing what you're doing as an, uh, the hard work that you're doing as a writer. And, and I feel like it's almost like, um, is like you are becoming the character and so and so in that way it really does come to life it, it's almost like the cross between a book and a you know a movie or a film or film work mm, yeah like kind of right in the middle of that yeah it's i mean it is it is kind of yeah 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 i can understand what you're saying because a lot of times people are like well the book was better than the movie and this is a chance for you to kind of be in the book but listen to somebody telling the story mm -hmm. Yeah, and you can kind of get lost. You don't have to read the um, read words. You don't. You can you can get lost in a different way. I don't know. Yeah. So I also um, what is okay. So this is kind of a two part question. What is a favorite project you've worked on, and also what has surprised you in a project that you weren't expecting? Hmm. Um, well, I will say, and I think I told you this earlier, but I will say that one of my favorite projects was your book. Coincidentally, like not having no, not either of us having an agenda here. I'm not um, paying it, I promise. <laughs> yeah, not, not at all. Uh, but one of my favorite projects was your book because, because of the surprise, like not the surprise and twist at the end. It was just such a delightfully simple story and i don't mean that in any bad way i think that simple stories are the most important stories you can are the, are the best stories you can read or listen to um it's simple simple in its in its writing not not in the construction of it and the structure of it of course but um so that was one of my favorites uh a lot of nonfiction that i've done another one i actually love world war ii um and so I love reading stories about it. And a lot of stories can just go off in some tangent in like, you know, the heaviness of World War II and whatnot, but it doesn't necessarily have to be that because people were living their lives at that time. Right. Um, so I think I, I think one of my favorite projects I'll say is yours. I have a bunch of other nonfiction ones. There was one about paratroopers in World War II. Yeah. Um, what is the name of that one? It's called Rock Force. It's a nonfiction, very different book. But it, there, there were in that, while you were reading and hearing about the paratroopers taking back an island in World War II, which is such a small story about World War II, had nothing to do with, you know, the bigger archetypal names of the, the time. But you're hearing these simple stories about yeah. these small guys, like small stories about um, relationships and characters that were happening at that time which was really interesting to me and that's similar to your story which is like mm -hmm. a simple story about uh two star crossed lovers more or less it just mm -hmm. happens to be in world war ii and you're using the circumstances at that time to create the conflict in the story um what surprised me um I don't know. I, I, I always try and uh, leave room for surprise whenever I'm narrating or reading a story. You know, when I prepare for a book, I, you know, learn accents and all the different stuff. But I always love, I used to, I, I studied as a classical singer when I was a kid. And so I learned, I, I learned a lot about breath and technique and all that kind of stuff and studying Shakespeare, same thing. I am a pentameter, et cetera. Um, and I did that early on in audiobooks. I would do breath marks and I would do all kinds of like structuring the story. And that was great. And I felt like I was doing work and being an A student. But at the same time, I was missing the story. I wasn't, I wasn't just sort of getting lost in the story. And what I love about a lot of books that I've read is there's always a surprise in the book if you can just allow yourself to get lost in the story. And so I try to learn the arc of the story, what's going on, who are the good guys, bad guys, you know, where you kind of need to go or where it's going to go mm -hmm. without telegraphing the story and also accents and pronunciation and all that kind of stuff. And there's a lot of work that can go into prepping a book. 
But I do, over my years of doing it, I've realized that leaving room for surprise and excitement and just letting the story come to life is half the joy of it. Is half right. the joy of it. And, and I wonder as well, um, so when you're selected to narrate a book, is it because, um, like for instance, is it because you know German? Um, is it because you've worked on other books kind of um, set in the same era? Because when, when I think about pronouncing a foreign language, I'm sure I'll mess it up no matter what I do. <laughs> Probably, um, you know, I, I don't know why people choose me as a narrator. Like, I can't give you an example of why, because I'm not the one that chooses me. Um, I would say it's a lot of those things. Like, for first of all, can the person tell a story? Great, awesome. Mm -hmm. um, what kind of voice lends itself? I know some producers that, I think a lot of producers work in different genres. So um, some will do nonfiction and some will do um, like uh, self-help books. And another one will do nonfiction and another one will do thriller. Another one will do uh, fiction, but thriller, that kind of stuff. Everybody works and has their specialty. So they know what kind of voice they're listening to. And sometimes there's producers that have told me, they're like, I heard your voice when I read this book and I can't get out of my head. So you have to do this book. And it's not mm -hmm. like they forced me to do it, but they want me to, they really encourage me to do the book because it's so exciting to them and that they heard me when they were reading. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that people get to know your your strengths and weaknesses, mostly your strengths. Mm -hmm. So obviously they're gonna, they're not gonna offer Grover Gardner, who's the um, producer on this, mm -hmm. an amazing narrator in and um, uh, one of my favorite narrators actually. And I remember telling him that and he was like, oh wow, tell me more. And so we had a whole conversation great great guy he is an incredible storyteller and i'm so happy i get to work with him whenever i get to work with him but i think he knows after doing a couple world war ii books he's like oh he knows the era he likes the era that's mm -hmm. cool um fortunately krista lewis who we did the who i did the co-narration with speaks fluent german so she was able to with our list of words she was able to read all the german words in the book so that we could be on the same page because yeah. not to say that you pronounce things differently, but at least then I know how she's pronouncing it, so I can pronounce it that way. And then everybody's in the same world, even the listeners in the same world, and there's no questions of, uh, why did you say that? She didn't say that that way, that kind of thing. Yeah, um, I, I noticed that too, and I was wondering how how that coordinates with you working with in a dual narr narrator situation. Do you listen to each other's chapters, or you just kind of have a little brainstorming session of how to pronounce certain words i think it's i think after you do it for a while and you know that you're confident and comfortable being a storyteller and an audiobook narrator you you know chris and i had a, a couple emails back and forth or a bunch of emails back and forth about specifically with slow march and, uh, of light it's like okay german they're speaking german but when yeah. are they but it's an english book so there's a what I love is when you start working with people that know what they're doing and have confidence in what they're doing, no matter what the job is, there's a shorthand and you don't have to describe, you know, you could just basically say, when are we, when is, when is she speaking German, but we're doing English. Right. Like even in the book, you say she's, you know, it's italicized when you're reading it, you can see that we need to telegraph mm -hmm. that and tell that to the audience without beating them over the head with it. Right. So we were like, well, how do we do that? And do we don't want to do it here and it's not here. And so there's a little bit of back and forth. Um, but I think a lot of the times it's kind of like, well, let's come to an agreement about how it's going to happen. And then, um, best of luck to you, you, you just know, go tell the other. story. Yeah. <laughs> you have to, you have to trust. I mean, in anything you have to trust, um, the other people that are with you collaborating, Grover has to trust us that we're going to tell a good story so that if I come back and I say the word wrong, he also has to trust that I'm going to go back and redo pickups, yeah. that kind of thing. There's a lot of trust which is wonderful. And there's no one micromanaging you and standing over you, um, telling you how to do something, which just allows you to find whatever it is that you have inside yourself to express yourself. Right. I would imagine that's similar to you as a writer. There's nobody micromanaging you and telling you how to write the story. There's an editor that will probably help you sculpt the story. Mm -hmm. But if they're a good editor, they're just figuring out a way for you to uh, fully express yourself. Yeah, I mean, they definitely trust yeah. us. A publisher will trust us with, you know, okay, Heather is she's going to do her research. We can trust her with this project. She's going to turn in a good book, and um, 
yeah, that we can put her under contract for. So yeah, I, yeah. I definitely can understand that. And and it's, but, it's and, about and kind of the, building your your career and your your reputation in the industry and putting out good work time and time again. Yeah. And if you, you know, uh, do, if you're not, I'll say if you're not a good storyteller, but that's super unfair. If, if you're not going to deliver on time, meet deadlines, or you can't do, you struggle with this and not this, I think people will help to steer you in that direction because, you know, everybody's on a deadline. They have, uh, you know, appointments to meet, whatnot. So um, if you're better at nonfiction or mm -hmm. World War II or German or French or languages right. or not language, they'll find out what, and you know, they, they kind of rely on you in the beginning to figure out and tell you what that is, but um, they'll lean into that because that's what you're good at. And different publishers and different producers hire me, I think, for different things. They might mm -hmm. know that I did a story, a fiction story uh, about World War II, but that's just not what our relation, what my relationship with this publisher is rather right. than this one. Right. It's also exactly. probably not the books that they get, in all honesty. Yeah. Um, so I actually wrote down my questions, so I make sure I get them. So, oh, okay. oh yeah, sure. So you kind of brought this up a little bit. So have you always just as a kid been naturally good at doing different voices or different accents, or is it something mm -hmm. you had to study? Um, I think I did, I did, I am very good at it, I think naturally. Mm -hmm. um, but I think I did, that comes from studying when I was younger. And like I said, I was a classical singer. So uh, a lot of my experience in the world is rhythmic and aural, A-U-R-A-L, mm -hmm. um, and just hearing and a lot of the, so I, I guess the, the with sounds, I'm, I think I'm very comfortable um, hearing something and replicating it back and not without, and I think through training and study, it's not rote, it's not boring. It's now, you know, with accents and impersonations, I've heard some actors that do, there's this one guy on Instagram, he does impersonations of like Ryan Reynolds and um, Arnold Schwarzenegger of all people. And his Arnold Schwarzenegger impersonation is uh, spotless. You can't even tell. He'll do a deep fake of like, you know, the face of Arnold Schwarzenegger and then his voice. And he talked about the idea of what it is to be a difference between, uh, what's the word in voiceovers? It's like difference between imitation and doing a voice comp more or less. You know, imitation, can't remember which one was which, but what he does is to replicate the exact personality of that yeah. person that he does. Yeah. Um, and that way, when you're in a conversation, rather than reading a script or something like that, you can change and move and adapt and still get through that person's personality. I bring that up because of accents. With accents like French or German, if I'm reading words that are in German, um, I usually have to listen to it because it's not natural to me. Mm -hmm. French, I know a little bit of. Uh, I would love to know more. Italian, I know a little bit of. But um, I'd have to just get the exact pronunciation of it and the exact like inflection of it. Hebrew and you know, I like to do my best to honor the language that it is mm -hmm. rather than not. Right. If that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Know. Yeah. That totally makes sense. Yeah. I, like I just do not the, have okay. that talent even remotely. <laughs> Um, so well, that's have you right. ever had that's where you're a writer. You're very good at writing. You don't need to I'm speak. Really good that's at okay. continually editing, I guess. But um, yeah. has there ever been a project you've had to turn down either because it didn't really fit with what you thought you wanted to represent yourself with, or maybe even just time or schedule? No, I mean, I, I wish that I could. I could say that I was really picky, and it's not to say that I'm not mm -hmm. picky. Um, I think there's a there's a a filtering process to the, what we were talking about with publishers and producers, there's a filtering process that happens with the producers. Their Grover is gonna offer me a World War II book mm -hmm. and not something else about some other subject. Cause, so that's a, a natural filtering process that happens in the industry. So there's, he would automatically pair us two rather than some other author uh, or, or narrator pairing, yeah. whatever. Right. Yeah. Um, so that already happens. So the books and the offers that I get are already pretty much what I want to do anyway, um, for the most part. So I haven't really turned down any work. Um, there's a couple of times I have, but 
that's usually out of scheduling um, and not out of like any disagreement with what anything right. is. I think as an actor, a lot of the times you just accept the work that mm -hmm. comes to you because you don't, I'm not, a, I, don't, I don't know how to phrase it. I'm just, I, I, I just tell stories and I love telling stories. So I don't think that there's any story that I shouldn't tell. Right. And I think I it's mean, pretty all clear All stories have value, I think too, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And there, and I can't, you know, I've done some books about politics. I've done some books about religion. I've done some books about World War II. And none of it has to do with my personal beliefs on a certain subject. Because strangely, the book might not even be for me. And mm -hmm. that's okay. Yeah. Um, true. I'm not a deeply religious person. You may be. We'll probably listen to different books. But if I narrate a book that you listen to about uh, a subject that's interesting to you, not interesting to me, that's doesn't matter as long as you're getting something from it and finding value in what you're listening to uh, and you enjoy the person's storytelling. I don't think it matters who narrates it and what their personal beliefs are. Yeah. Personally. Yeah. That, yeah. That now does make sense. <laughs> yeah. um, okay. So, so I'm really curious of just kind of what is your kind of typical day when you're working on an audio book? Like, do you have to, are you putting in eight hours a day? Are you taking breaks? How does it work? Oh, you definitely take breaks. I do one hour sessions or one hour like runs of time. Uh, John August is a writer and he talks about runs um, as a writer where mm -hmm. he'll turn everything off for an hour and just write. And then when he's done, he takes five minutes, seven minutes, 10 minutes, whatever works for each person. Um, and that's what he does. And I do the same thing with audiobooks because you kind of get into a headspace and you can get in your own way, I think a lot. Um, so with audiobooks, when I'm working on an audiobook, I'm fortunate enough to have built my own booth. So I um, can kind of, and, and I can set my schedule and over time I've realized what works for me. So I'll, you know, work out in the morning and have a kind of a slow morning that my fiance hates because she has a day job and she has to go straight to work, which is I absolutely <laughs> respect. And I like slower mornings and that's my thing. Um, but, uh, I, I'm able to have a bit of a slower morning and then come in and work and work in a booth and I have a set space. So inevitably it just becomes about just going into the booth and all I need to do is read stories. Um, some days I need to prepare, some days I need to prep and find word pronunciation and all kinds of different things um, to set myself up for that. And usually the first day of every book is kind of an awkward, what is this? What's the voice? What is the author? What is the author's voice in this book? Yeah. Um, finding that. But once you're on day two of a book, and depending on how much people, each individual reads and how much audio they can get through in a day, mm -hmm. some can get through a lot, some can get through a little. Um, all you need to do is just get into a booth and read a story. Yeah. And it's kind of delightful in that way. But there's some prep work and whatnot. And you have to work on pacing and technique and blah. Well, and, and I also was thinking, you know, if you got a cold or a sore throat, you probably couldn't work for a few days, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, it's, it became suddenly became more, <laughs> um, not necessarily with the pandemic that definitely mm -hmm. worked in our, us working alone in booths worked in our favor, but that was definitely a part of it. But if I'm getting sick or I feel coming down with something, there's different techniques you can use to um, I guess we make your voice sound better or at least comfortable talking because there is, a, there's also an element of voice fatigue at the end of the day. If I hear that my voice is really tired, that's going to slowly pull people out of the story and I won't be able to connect with people. So it can affect your voice. So can sickness and you might just have to take more days off than you normally would. Yeah. 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 Um, so can you let us know about any current or upcoming projects? Um, I mean, yeah, I could talk about them, but uh, a lot of them are nonfiction. I have yeah. one that I'm going to talk about the microbiome of the thyroid. Interesting. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know anything about it yet. I haven't read the book yet. Um, um, but then there's some other stories like Oh, I can't. I, I would have to go through my calendar and look at them. I don't remember all the stories because I'm, the same I'm way when I'm writing, kind like, of one book to another. Yeah. Like someone's like, "What are you working on?" I'm and in, I have to take a minute it. to think about it. Yeah, exactly. 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 You're in that story, that and that's where you're at. Yeah. Um, I just finished one about missions of Mars or missions on Mars, 
which was really interesting. There's a scientist that actually worked on the missions on the Mars trips to Mars, the NASA trips yeah. to Mars um, in the 70s and then all through the 80s and 90s and stuff that you just don't really know about and all the difficulty that they've come across um, to having to find a rover to go there and different kinds of rovers and why it took so long and how long is it going to take us to get there and what is it like on Mars mm -hmm. and the different kinds of sand and wind patterns and all the different stuff. So that, I just read that book. So that's what I'm that's really cool. And <laughs> do you feel like you kind of retain that knowledge and kind of like in a couple of years you can still talk about that book or is like reading, do you just get to a zone where you're not really, I know these are like really weird questions, but <laughs> No, 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 no. They're not weird. It's a, audiobook reading is a weird job. I yeah. sit in a box for eight hours a day and read a story into a mic. And it's weird. It's a, it, it's not a normal job that anybody would think of. Maybe nowadays they would, but not normally. Um, sometimes I do. There are some books that are very, uh, that affect me a lot, like Slow March of Light, in all honesty. It, it fact, affected me a lot. And uh it lives, it, I think all the books live in me somewhere. I just don't, I can't recall the information right away. Since we're having a conversation about it, I went back and like skimmed the book and I was like, oh yeah, oh, and then this happened and that happened. Oh, yeah. And that's why I love how it's sort of set up because you talk about Bob's experience in the army, but you don't dwell on it. And then it goes straight into his missions mm -hmm. um, with the army and then how you get to know Germany. And then he goes right into learning German and doesn't talk to the woman much anymore. And then. I can now recall the book yeah. back to you. And I wasn't even reading it. I skimmed it for five minutes, but I wasn't really reading it. So I can retain the information. Um, fiction books, I think, are easier to retain than nonfiction books. Because, for example, Missions of Mar Missions mm -hmm. to Mars, Missions on Mars. I'm going to say the, the book wrong all the time. Uh, Missions on Mars. I will not be able to retain a lot of the information. And going, it's also a lot of information to be yeah. there. There's books that I'm reading for fun that I can't retain all the information, um, but I think fiction's easier for me because it's a it's a linear story, mm -hmm. so there is a beginning, a middle, and an end. And in nonfiction, there is a beginning, a middle, and an end, but it's not as the route to get there is not as clear. Right. There's so much dense information in nonfiction. I remember once going to a book club, and for some reason, I thought they were the book club had chosen my most recent book. And they started talking about a book that I had written like five years before. So I said, oh, I need to go to the restroom really quick. So I took my phone, I pulled up my Kindle <laughs> app and my old book and I skimmed through like just for a couple minutes. Cause yeah. I can remember like the main character's name but I couldn't really remember the other people's names. So then I came yeah, back. Yeah, but you can kind of remember the story arc. You're like, oh, and then, oh, yeah. and that whole section I forgot about that kind of, <laughs> totally. Yeah. I think so it's, I I think it's sort of unfair for people. I mean, I think it's wonderful that fans are fans and they're rabid fans and that's great. I, I love that. I really do. But it's sort of it's sort of unfair for people like, you know, I think of Star Trek people. That's a rude sentence. Trekkies, star people that just love Star yeah. Trek. I think yeah. it's wonderful. Friends of mine love Star Trek. Um or comic book uh lovers. There was a guy I went to a yeah. comic book, my friend wrote a comic book and I went to buy it. And this guy behind the counter could remember, and it, like I went in and I was like, oh my God, a wash of memories. I haven't right. been to a comic book store in 20 years, whatever. He could remember all these stories, like storylines from all these comic books in the 80s and the 90s and 2000s. And I was like, wow, wow yeah, Spawn. And he was like, oh yeah. And then like the, the 15th episode, or then they did this whole arc. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm upset about like how Marvel did this with that. And I was like, wow, I'm jealous. Because that is so wonderful that you can remember all that. Yeah. But if you were able to pull any of those writers out, I can imagine and talk to them. I can imagine they would have no recollection sometimes right. of what they were doing. And they're like, I know that right now I'm writing something very different, but that's what I can talk about. Mm -hmm. It's hard. I heard a story that R in REM was one of my favorite bands when I was growing up. Mm -hmm. Michael Stipe forgot the lyrics to one of his what I don't know, like night swimming or something like that. Right. And uh, he forgot the lyrics and he will have the lyrics on a uh, uh, a stand on the stage so that he can remember them because he's written so many songs. Oh, I, I yeah, oh, I would totally, I would totally do that. So I don't know if you can see some of the comments, but since oh, I, I can't. have this streaming to a couple of platforms, so like this is just the StreamYard one, but one lady, oh, cool. Mara says, I think you did a fantastic job on the 
audiobook and then someone else oh, said, I love the audiobook so much, one of my faves of 2021. And I listened to a lot of books, well done. And actually this morning at the gym. Um, so when the book was coming out, I gave all the ladies I work out with the, at the gym, I gave them a free copy of the book. So I'm like, I'm not gonna you know, self-promote myself too much. And now like just this morning, like two of them said, I listened to the audio book. And one said, yeah, the, narr the narrator, well, it was mostly talking about you and Krista, but was saying they're just awesome and, and I'm a narrator snob. And so it was kind of, it's kind of fun to hear feedback and I think so it's great. Inter interviewing them on Facebook. And so um, anyway, but yeah, but after this, I'm going to put the interview on YouTube so we can okay. share a lot more and yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, I think it's wonderful. I mean, this is, I don't, I don't engage in a lot of social media. I mean, I wish I did. I wish I loved it. Um, more than I'm engaging in. I, I did for a while. Anyway, yeah. I love this. This is one of my favorite things about um, social media and all of the mm -hmm. things that are coming out of it is the niche world of where people can be themselves and express themselves however they want um, and be that that part of themselves that they need to hide. But then here yeah. you have a platform for talking about it and, and gathering with people. I think it's wonderful. I think it's wonderful. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Um, You're welcome. Thank you I'm really me. excited to, I, I did look up some of your other books and some of them look really interesting, the ones that you've narrated. And also oh, yeah. I watched some of your voiceover clips on your website the other day. So oh yeah, on the web, yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely have a lot of time. Please feel free, go to stevengraybill.com, <laughs> riveting yeah. stuff. I know, but um, you know, and you don't have to be on Facebook, but I'll share this around. Um, Oh, please I do. definitely please get do. like this social media thing. I mean, I if I was not an author, I would probably not be on any social media. <laughs> it can just be overwhelming. I'm on yeah. Instagram and I love Instagram. I love the visual media. I guess that comes yeah. along back to the music thing. But I love the visual medium. Um, can definitely get lost on reels on Instagram. We'll never join TikTok because it will be <laughs> cracked and I won't do anything with my life. Um, but I, I do enjoy uh, connecting with people but I guess yeah. I just haven't fully clicked into uh, what it is, but I, I do think it's wonderful that people can connect so readily and yeah. very easily. Yeah. But please share it around. It was wonderful talking to you. Well, thank you so much and best of luck with, with all of your upcoming projects and hopefully maybe my book and your narrating will cross paths again someday. You never know. I, I really <laughs> genuinely, I do hope so. I really do hope so. Well, thank you so much. Have a good You're night. You're welcome. You too.